Good morning. My name is Connie McLaughlin, and thank you for joining us today for utilizing communication and sensory strategies for the Incident Reduction Series on Autism. We are so happy you were able to join us today on this beautiful day. Uh, before we get started with our presentation, we wanted to go through a few housekeeping items. Many of you are very familiar with the uh, GoToWebinar system, but just in case you're not, we wanted to go over those uh, slides with you now. One second, we're having a little technical difficulty here. Um, the GoToWebinar system allows for people to log on to the system by phone and by um, their computer, and we would like for you to, sorry, one second, a little difficulty here. Um, we would like you to log on through your computer so that your attendance is registered with us. Um, if you are also accessing your phone because the audio is better, we would like for you to um, also log on to your computer. You will only get uh, credit if you are logged on to your computer. So um, if you are logging on through your phone as well, please make sure that you turn the speakers down on your uh, computer, otherwise you'll continue to get some background or echoing noise. If you have any questions throughout our presentation, we will allow for some time at the end, or if we're able, we'll take those questions um, during the presentation. Any questions that we do not have time to address during today's webinar, we will um, email to all the participants at the end of the webinar. And so you'll have a, a listing of all those questions and responses from the speakers. And um, again, we wanna thank you for being here. We know this training is geared towards SSAs and investigative agents, but really it's beneficial for all of us working in this field for the, the important work that we do and in supporting individuals with intellectual and developmental disabilities. Um, while I introduce the speakers, I'm gonna go through and try to fix our slides. Um, today we have with us Jody Giesler. She's a regional manager with the MUI office, and Heather Leffler, who is a consultant with the department. And I didn't even say your name, your title, right, Heather? You want to correct me? Sure, Northeast Regional Liaison. Thanks, Connie. <laughs> Thanks, Heather. So anyway, um, we're really happy that both of them have spent the time going through and coming up with some different strategies that we can use when we're doing investigations and developing prevention plans and just generally doing the important work that all of you do. So um, I'm gonna have them start off with their presentation and I'm gonna try to fix the slides as they begin. So we will catch up. All right, good morning. So this webinar is based on the OCALI, which is the Ohio Center for Autism and Low Incidence. It's their autism series that they've been doing across the state of Ohio. This, is a, this webinar is a brief overview of communication and sensory strategies that you'll be able to share with teams. We will also be sending the link for the autism strategies in action if you need a more in-depth resource for these two areas. So we'll go ahead and get started. So communication is the most important of all life skills. It allows us to share information and develop relationships. <clears throat> So when supporting people with autism spectrum disorder and folks with intellectual and developmental disabilities in general, there can be some communication differences. The first, they can easily be misunderstood or they can easily misunderstand. So individuals who have little to no speech, um, a lot of times they'll be using gestures, tugging on your arm to get information to you. Thanks for your patience as we're figuring out the screens. Um, you all have your PowerPoints, um, so hopefully you can just keep following along with us. Connie's working hard to get this uh, going for us. Um, good Tuesday morning. Um, for those that do have verbal communication, uh, folks with ASD sometimes have difficulty with the rules of conversation or understanding gestures and facial ex um, expressions. There we go. Um, they also will use scripts from TV or movies. Um, they will interpret words or conversations literally. 
Um, so there's difficulty with both verbal and nonverbal communication. Jody, can you share an incident that shows difficulties with communication, please? Yes. So the next scenario um, is a young woman who only has a few words, um, but she had an incident where staff had to restrain her on and off for about 45 minutes. And she was walking down the hallway and just suddenly started banging her head against the brick wall. She dropped to the ground and started punching herself in the face, um, hitting her head on the floor. She was saying the word ow and mo, which I think is her word for mom. And it, it really came out of the blue. And um, in this scenario, staff, um, you know, they did everything they could to try to get her to calm down. And the cosmic strain factor was um, something the IA said was the individual has a history of being easily upset when she doesn't feel well due to illness. And so for this person, she wasn't feeling well. And they, you know, they were trying to figure out what to do to make her feel better. And uh, the SSA ended up contacting the family. And when she left her day have program, uh, they took her to the doctor and it turns out she had a sinus infection and a throat infection. And so, you know, we have an example of great team communication because they knew that this is something that in her history that when she doesn't feel well, she self injures her, um, and uh, really can hurt herself badly. So it's really important. I can't emphasize enough the, important to lis the importance of listening to the message behind the behavior. All right, so how can we help? We can use um, our own voice and body to support communication. You can monitor your own conversations. Less is more. Giving wait time when you're working with somebody with ASD. And also consistency. So how can we monitor our own verbal language and conversations? Um, first, just being aware that there can be multiple conversations and noises and environments that we really take for granted. Um, a good way to really assess this is just to record it, and you'll be surprised at just how much is really going on in that um, environment. Um, and people with ASD really struggle with all those competing sounds in their environment. Um, you can also develop a cue or a gesture to remind other team members that they're talking too much. This is a great tool to use because we just talk a lot. Um, and this could be a motion with your hands to slow down, or you could have an agreement that when you tug on your ear, that means to use fewer words. Um, the second, less is more, just being cognizant that there could be too much repetition or just a lot of words being used to explain what you want um, the person to be doing or to consider. Um, Please emphasize using action words and pair words with visual support. So an example of less is more, um, if it's time for dinner and you need help from John, you could say, John, table, while holding out the fork, spoons, napkins, and pointing to the table. That's much easier than saying all the words that are on your screen is just too much. But that's really how we interact. So you have to be mindful that that is way too many words and it's going to cause confusion. All right, using wait time. We can't emphasize this enough. Again, we're used to using a lot of words and repeating ourselves pretty quickly if we don't get a response. And when you're interacting with people with ASD, you have to assess how long it takes that person to process information. You know, you could wait 10 seconds. Um, some people need up to 30 seconds to be able to process what you've said to them. Um, so really know um, what that person needs. And also developing a sign or gesture for all the support staff if you're not waiting long enough, um, just to give them the cue that, whoo, slow it down a little bit. You could also develop a protocol, um, you know, just giving one instruction, stop, wait quietly for 10 seconds. If there's no response, repeat and wait another 10 seconds. If the person doesn't seem to understand or doesn't respond after two times, add a picture, a gesture, or another cue and wait again. Just because they're taking longer doesn't mean that they're refusing. They could just be processing what you've said to them. And the fourth area, be consistent. We have lots of ways to communicate. It's time to go home. Are you ready? Let's go. It's about time. So work as a team to use the same words so the person isn't confused. It's time to go home. Visual, visual, visual. Schedules, routines, and choices. Once the words leave your mouth, they're gone forever. So what are visual supports? They're concrete items, pictures, symbols, printed words, or a combination that can help people to maintain attention, communicate, 
and remember what you've said. Jody, do you have an incident you'd like to share about I, visuals? I do. So um, this is actually, for this person, it's a missing persons trend. And um, this individual lives in the supported living setting, supported living setting, and he's close to his grandparents' house. Um, he can walk there. And sometimes he leaves during the middle of the night or really late at night or sometimes during the day to go visit his grandparents. So the team has tried several um, preventative strategies, like they've increased his um, visual, you know, when they visually check on him, how often they do it when he's awake, how often they do it when he's asleep. Um, they put alarms on doors, they put alarms on windows, and sometimes the alarms had malfunctions, so he was able to get out of the house in the middle of the night, and that's where we've had the missing persons MUI. And where do they find him? Of course, at Grandma's house. So the team has been working on getting really creative to figure out, well, you know, what's going on here? We've tried all these different things, but we're realizing we're not getting to the heart of the matter. That cause and contributing factor is, I live close to Grandma and Grandpa's. I want to go visit them. I think everybody would agree that that's a fun place to go to see grandma and grandpa. So they, we kind of created a visual schedule at the side um, of the, on the slideshow here to show you that, you know, maybe it's if you have it in the concrete and there's a picture, first eat breakfast, then it's time to go visit grandma and grandpa. But then also a cue to show, you know, at this time of day, it's time to go to sleep. It's like, good night, grandma and grandpa. Maybe you have a phone call to them to say good night, but this is a clear, concrete way to demonstrate, yep, you can visit grandma, let's schedule a time, let's put it in a picture calendar so you know when that's going to be, and um, the team doesn't have to worry that you've disappeared from the home again. Excellent. All right, so when you're going to be using visual supports, it's a good idea to do some planning. They should be planned in advance. And you should talk about, um, you know, which visual supports does the person already use or how are they responding to currently. Um, it's always best to assign one person, the point person, to be responsible for the visual supports. Um, you need to consider location. Are the visual supports going to be portable? Um, are you going to use them in the community when you go to the library or the grocery store? Or are they going to be housed in one place, such as work or home? Do you need to laminate them due to weather issues or being around water, like in the kitchen? Um, and then how to use them. You have to monitor and teach the use of these materials to the person with ASD, as well as the staff and family who are working with them. How many people are involved? Who, when, and where? And do staff really understand the importance of the visual schedule? Um, you also need to address changes as needed. And also, as part of the changes, too, is there a backup in case you know, if you're using electronic devices, an iPad, you know, do you have a backup system just in case the iPad isn't charged or disappears? Unfortunately, sometimes that happens. Um, also, with the visual supports, you know, do you have to create a visual support for the all day with the daily routine? Or does it make more sense for this person to have a visual schedule for event to event to event? Just a lot to determine, um, and it's always best to do some planning ahead of time so that goes as smoothly as possible. Jody, do you have an example for us? Yes. So this was a unapproved behavior support MUI, and there were um, several escorts within about an hour, an hour and a half time period. So this individual lived in the same home for years, and he moved. So when the bus went to drop him off at his new home, he wouldn't get off the bus because he's like, wow, I don't even know where I am. So he had to be escorted off the bus. So as soon as they got in the driveway, he started running down the road. So they escorted him again. They got him in the house, got him calmed down, but he left again. And so um, the IA was great because the cause and curing factor was, well, he was unfamiliar with the surroundings. He didn't truly understand this was his new home. Even though he had been there to visit, he'd worked with the provider, had you know dinners with roommates, sleepovers. Um, he didn't quite get it. So we're wondering how this incident could have been avoided. And maybe if they would have had pictures of him in front of his house, or this is my new bedroom, these are my new roommates, this is us having dinner or lunch, and this is my backyard, this is my staff. Maybe that clear concrete picture would have helped him realize like, this is my home, this is where I live. But I'm wondering if this could be a global, not prevention, but for people across the state that move we probably have people moving every day somewhere in the state of Ohio in our system. Yes. 
and just wondering if that could be a support for them to help them understand that, you know, this is where I live, this is my new house. And so they can have that transition and it makes it a little bit easier for them. I think that makes perfect sense because we know that transitions are often a difficult time for the individuals that we support, for all of us, honestly. Absolutely. And any kind of visual cue or, um, you know, schedule or something like that might help alleviate some of the stress and anxiety. So, yeah. So here are some visual schedule examples. Um, I'm not going to go through all of them. I do want to share whenever I do a visit with providers who um, are serving a lot of people with ASD, they tend to have these big Velcro boards on the walls that have lots of different activities. Um, and I see them everywhere I go. So there's lots of, lots of providers using visual schedules already, but these are just a couple of op options. And here are some more too. Um, you can get, you know, here there's some for work. Um, there's some simple ones like step by step. There's also some cards that are laminated with a ring so the person can refer to them throughout their day. But lots of options. Yeah, just Google visual schedules and you'll, you'll have hundreds and hundreds of options online. Absolutely. Along with that, um, after the webinar, we're going to be sending a resource um, that was developed by the DD Council for you to share with teams and to explore. It's just assistive technology. Um, you know, sometimes it can be costly and you're not sure if it will work. So assistive technology lending libraries are a great resource. So we will get that out to you following the webinar. So teams can try things out um, before you actually purchase them. And we're going to talk a little bit about communication considerations when you're conducting interviews. So, and I know you probably already do all these things, but it's just to be cognizant of, you know, how does the com individual communicate? Can you figure that out before the interview? You know, do they use sign languages or sign language? Um, are there communication devices that they use, an iPad? Do they use pictures or icons? And then to consider how long does it take for them to process the question that you're asking? And then on the other side of that, how long does it take for them to figure, you know, to formulate their response? Um, keep questions short and to the point. Don't use idioms like spill the beans, although my kids say now they say spill the tea. <laughs> I'm not sure what that means. But anyway, um, but keep the questions clear and concrete. And maybe the person needs an interpreter, or maybe it's English as a second language, so maybe they need someone that can not only do sign language, but other, you know, speak other languages. And is there somebody that can come to the interview that the person's comfortable with? But then again, we talk about sometimes there are too many people in the interview room, and that might be a distraction. So how do you maintain that balance um, when you're when you're conducting an interview with an individual? And certainly, if you have more than one person in the room, whether that's a trusted staff person. Um, or another investigator, we obviously want to limit the number of people, but then also before the interview starts, making sure you know who's going to be the lead person asking the questions so that there's not multiple people questioning or throwing commands at that person. All right, so now we're going to move into sensory. So every day we are exposed to thousands of sensory experiences. It is critical for all of us to have a balanced sensory system to be able to respond to our environments and situations. We all continually work to achieve self-regulation. Sometimes we see behaviors that seem unusual or difficult to explain when we're working with people with ASD or intellectual developmental disabilities. Sometimes they come out of nowhere and we have no idea why it happens. Um, and some behaviors may not respond to conventional behavior management techniques. So an example, a person with an increase in restraints and the team, you know, is struggling to figure out what is going on with this person because nothing has changed in their routine, in their environment. There's no medical reason. They've already explored all of that. Teens really need to look at sensory needs um, when these kinds of situations pop up. So it is entirely possible, and I know that I've worked with a few teams, where the person is doing things to get that restraint so that they get that sensory input. And we'll be talking a little bit about that in a minute, so it'll make sense. But looking at behavior from only a traditional sense of behavior management, you could miss that inwardly the person may be using all of their resources to maintain their behavior and they have nothing left for learning, interacting, or participating. 
And also, often the behavior is the sum of many sensory events over a period of time and not just the moment prior to the event. So your ABC charts, um, you know, sometimes they're not very helpful when you're looking at sensory because it could be the whole day of sensory experiences that person has where they finally just, they can't, they can't manage it anymore. All right, so let's look at our bodies as a sensory bucket. Um, so we work throughout the day to keep our bucket filled and balanced. Sometimes, though, our sensory buckets become unbalanced, where we have too much water. So an example of that would be where if you are sensitive um, to sounds and you are at the grocery store and the constant beeping of the machines and the music of the loudspeaker and, you know, and then uh, the staff at Kroger telling everybody to check their refrigerators and then, you know, the child that's crying in aisle five, it's just way too much stimulation. So your bucket would be overflowing with water. Too little would be um, where an individual just loves staff's soft sweater and won't stop touching it, even though the per staff person said, okay, that's enough, let's get back to what we're doing, and they just keep going back, and it, they're just not getting enough of that input. So we do our best when our bucket is comfortably full. The sensory input and experiences is the water that fills that bucket. However, the demands of life continually drain the bucket. So we need well-selected, ongoing, completely individualized experiences throughout the day to keep our bucket full. And also, these sensory experiences should never, ever be forced. So over-responders, people who are hypersensitive, they may overreact with minimal sensory input. Jody, do you have an example? Yes, so um, this actually was an missing person MUI and an individual, he got home from his day hab program and his roommate was being loud and kept repeatedly calling his name. And the individual who had just right of, arrived home, he began pacing, he was holding his ears. So kind of like Heather said earlier that, you know, maybe it was a crazy day at the day hab, maybe the ride home was loud but he was clearly showing some sensory concerns with his pacing and holding his ears because he just couldn't take any more noise. He ended up, start, he started hitting himself and then he left the home and he was missing for a while. Um, they actually even called the police, but they finally were able to find him and staff just let him walk around the neighborhood, didn't even talk. Excellent. They gave him that quiet time. Um, but again, the, it's just the sensory thing. It wasn't that he was mad at his roommate. It was just, a sensory overload, which I think is the cause and contributing factor to this whole scenario. And, uh, you know, to, but to think about what other preventative measures could work for the long term. I mean, does this person have a quiet space in his house that he can go to or a quiet place in the backyard? Or is there a park nearby? Or can he just go for a walk in the neighborhood? Something to help our individuals that need some of that downtime you know, is there a space available to them? And do we know that that's what the person needs? So just figuring out that person's sensory needs, um, I think is so vitally important. I just wanted to um, bring up, there's a provider in Columbus who I was reading some of their um, UI logs, and one of their preventative measures was they've started doing yoga classes and meditation classes. And they also have like an outside garden where the individuals go to kind of self-calm and just like you or I would go to the park and just get away from everyone and everything. So I just thought it was an amazing um, way to kind of address that need for people to go and have some quiet and just to be with themselves and calm down, so. Excellent. So characteristics of over-responders, over we've been describing them. They just can't take it. They will do anything to get away from uh, whatever um, sensory input um, that just they can't take it. Uh, intolerance to fabrics, just make it stop. Under responders, like um, the example I gave where the person who just wouldn't stop touching the soft sweater, their bucket never gets full. They are always looking for more and more sensory input. It's always looking for ways, you know, to get that input. Some additional characteristics of um, under responders who are seeking and craving input, they're constantly moving. They're in others' body space. They crash into walls, couches, may injure others, people or objects, craving touching certain fabrics, textures. They may not even notice touch or may be under-responsive to pain. All right, let's get into the senses themselves. 
um, the power senses, proprioception, vestibular, and tactile. The power senses mean um, that the senses have a significant impact um, to regulate, stabilize, process, and help us to remain alert in our environment. These power senses have long-lasting effects to fill our bucket quickly and help a person function best. So tactile is the first one we're going to get into, which is the touch. Um, the location is our skin, biggest organ in our body. It has two systems. One is the protective. It lets us know if we are in danger. So if we touch a hot stove, we'll, you know, our uh, skin will send a message up to our brain that, ouch, that hurts, I could get hurt. Um, discriminative is the second system, and it lets us know where, what, and how we are touched. Um, this can be very calming to us as well. Um, the protective system, as I said, this um, will activate a fight, fright, or flight. This is not a cognitive response, so people do not choose to respond in this way. It's immediate and it's a reaction. And as I said, the discriminative system is calming and organizing, and it helps us to learn and think. So what are some characteristics that we would see when supporting people with ASD? Um, you might see that touch is very painful. Even the thought of being touched increases their anxiety and possible, um, possible escape behaviors. They may be intolerant to wearing their glasses or hearing aids or certain fabrics. So what can we do to help people who may have issues with um, the tactile system? First off, no surprises. Always um, ask for permission when entering somebody's personal space or touching. Always ask for permission. Um, people may like water and swimming and baths um, who have tactile issues. Connie, would you like to add a few comments? Yeah, sure. So we know just from reviewing MUIs across the state um, that there's a tendency for individuals with ASD to be drawn to water, whether that's um, ponds, rivers, baths. And a lot of times in the right environment with the right support, that can be a very calming and a great activity. We do sometimes see deaths related to um, these individuals where they have left the home, a uh, family home without supervision and gone into a river or lake and um, drowned, unfortunately. Um, we've seen other cases that we've reviewed through our mortality review board where individuals um, have like a nightly routine where they may go into the bath and take a bath for a long period of time and typically are unsupervised and, and generally that works out well. They seem to really enjoy that. It's kind of built into their day. However, we always need to take into consideration you know, other kind of diagnoses or medical supports that might be needed. So in some cases, individuals, um, while seemingly safe in that kind of environment, may have had a seizure. And we've seen a couple cases where individuals have had a seizure and drowned when that was part of the normal day, just to be in the bath for several hours at a time. So we're not saying to limit those activities. We just want to make sure there's the right supports. Uh, provided to individuals to make sure they're safe when they're around bodies of water, whether that be in a bathtub, you know, swimming in a pool or near, uh, you know, a lake or a pond. So I just wanted to bring that up. And then I, I have a scenario. Um, this was an MUI. It was actually an unapproved behavior support. And an individual was at his team meeting and he, he kind of was starting to get upset and he began yelling. And um, and then the mom kept yelling at him to shut up because he he actually happens to have Tourette's as well. And so several things were being said, and she was just trying to get him to be quiet. And um, it turned into, you know, his yelling turned into him swinging his arms and punching staff. So he got up from the table and went over to the corner of the room, and he was kind of crouched in the corner. And I think he realized that he was having a sensory overload, and he was just trying to get away from everybody. Well, the whole team got up and followed him to the corner of the room and surrounded him. And it just really went downhill even more from there. So they ended up having to call the police. He was handcuffed and taken to a psychiatric hospital. So I think the real cause and contributing factor to this, again, was a sensory overload. What could the team have done to help him calm down? Maybe they could have turned the lights out and maybe everyone left the room except maybe his favorite person 
just to give him the time because it seems like he knew he needed some space away from this meeting. Um, but, uh, you know, I think the team kind of, well, they had him cornered and, you know, we know if we corner an animal or something in the wild, like that's a bad thing, like get away, get, you know, don't, don't do that. So just thinking about the sensory message behind the behavior when you're looking at MUIs and what was the true cause and contributing factor. Um, let's look at some examples with Heather to see if any of the individuals you support share some of these characteristics. Okay, so we're going to go into the second power sense, which is vestibular. Um, vestibular input lets us know how fast or the direction we are moving. So it, and it's located in the inner ear and it's your sense of balance as well. So people who are hypersensitive to vestibular input, um, here are some examples of those characteristics. Um, they may be apprehensive when they're walking down the street if the sidewalk is uneven or, you know, getting out of the car to go into the store, how the curb is up a little bit higher and they, they hesitate. And, you know, I, I remember when I used to be a direct service professional and I, I used to support a young little girl and she inevitably, she really had a hard time going up and down those um, sidewalks and those curbs. So you just had to give her some time and offer some patience. Um, so what can we do? Oh, wait, here's some... Um, here are some characteristics of people who are hyposensitive, meaning they can't get enough. These are people who are body whirling, jumping, spinning, rocking, pacing. They are a constant flurry of activity. And, and sometimes that's even visual. Um, I know some, some folks, um, the little windmills, they, they will sit and watch those or just, you know, spinning things. They just, they can't get enough of it. Um, so what are some strategies that we can do for vestibular input? Again, this is built proactively into the person's day, throughout the day. This is not a reward. Um, to give um, vestibular input as a reward would be like expecting somebody to function well without their glasses or their hearing aids, and then expecting to give their glasses as a reward. We just, we wouldn't do that. And this is the same thing, it's biological. So. Some strategies for vestibular input, um, rocking, um, rocking chairs, sliders, walking, running laps, hiking, just that movement, swivel chairs, tire swings, all of those things will give that good vestibular input. Moving into the third power sense is proprioception. Proprioception allows us to know where our bodies are in space and helps us with motor planning. Um, some example characteristics, um, this is the person who might seem a little clumsy, has a tendency to fall, they bump into walls, they bump into people, they crash sometimes into walls, um, they may eat in a sloppy manner despite, you know, lots of um, prompts or just lots of effort to not eat sloppily, they just, they're, they're not really sure where their bodies are in space. So how can we support people who have proprioception um, needs? Anything that gives compression to the, jo uh, the joints and muscles is a strategy. Running, dancing, yoga, swimming. And as you'll notice, these are the same things that help our vestibular system as well. So those two together, pairing that and providing that input throughout the day will really keep that bucket full. This is a great example, too, a body sock. These are a favorite among those who need a lot of proprioception input. You can even get sheets now, like a fitted sheet and a top sheet, and it just gives that that input that lets you know where your body is. Um, all right, so while sensory input and experiences fill the bucket throughout the day, um, you know, the demands of life drain the bucket throughout the day too, some faster than others. So just making sure that you're using the vestibular, proprioceptive, and tactile senses, um, making sure that input is there because those three will quickly fill your bucket and keep it filled longer. That's why we call them the power senses. Um, I do want to back up a little bit and just say that the sensory bucket concept has been a favorite among the providers um, going through the autism series to train their staff on how to support people with sensory needs. Um, so I just wanted to share that this bucket, um, sensory bucket, is, is really getting some traction throughout the state. Um, there's some other sensory input, though, that just kind of trickles into the bucket and fills it slowly, visual, sound, and um, taste and smell, and we'll get ready to go through that here in a minute. All right, so the visual system. What are some um, example characteristics? Sometimes people are very overly sensitive to light and sunlight, even on cloudy days. Um, and sometimes people are unable to focus on one item when there's too much, too much visual um, clutter in their environment. 
So some strategies that we can use to support um, the visual system. You can dim the lights, use natural lights and lamps, use fewer lights, um, use indirect lighting and filter lighting like Jody has um, described, like these panels that you can put over um, uh, fluorescent light bulbs just so it kind of softens and, and helps people feel more comfortable in their environment. So moving on to auditory system, here are some characteristics that you may see when you're supporting people with ASD, head banging, um, or they attend to sounds such as the, the motor in a fan, they love the sound of a fan or a vacuum cleaner, or it could be the opposite where they can't stand the sound of the fan or the, the, the vacuum cleaner. Um, and sometimes you'll see where people are very sensitive to pitch or complexity of sounds, and it's not just always the volume. So there's a lot to consider when you're looking at auditory systems. I know we're moving fast through this information, um, and this is kind of just a just an introduction, and we'll get you some more uh, resources. So if you need to take a deeper dive into the sensory systems, you'll be able to have that opportunity. Um, so here are some interventions to support um, auditory input. Um, noise canceling headphones or earplugs to kind of help um, block the sound so somebody can just get calm. Um, providing white noise, such as a fan or a fountain. And I know the head, the headphones that, that block all the noise out, they've been a godsend for my family member who has autism. Like we have a giant 4th of July party every year and it means a lot to his parents and his sister to be part of the 4th of July fireworks and, but sound it just is overwhelming and then to see the flame like he's afraid of fire too and it's really really upsetting so we usually have him in another part in the house with his, his headphones on so he doesn't have to experience it but yet the family can be out there with the rest of the family members and it it really makes it a, it, it has helped him so much just with maneuvering his system and that you know the environment around him that's awesome Okay, moving on to the olfactory system, our sense of smell. Um, so you may see individuals who may be avoiding environments because of odors like Kmart or McDonald's or the mall. Um, you know, there could be lots of different competing smells at the mall. Um, or, or maybe they seek out a certain staff member that they like the way their hair smells and they smell their hair. So, you know, it, it's just, it's either hypersensitive or hyposensitive. Yeah, my same family member, he hates to come to my house because I happen to like the scent. Japanese cherry blossom and he walks in my house and he says oh it smells bad in here I, I hate that smell your house stinks actually actually usually it's what he says it's like, your house stinks and he runs outside I'm like oh sorry yeah and we don't realize how sensitive some people are to those smells yeah because yeah. I can't even smell it anymore so I'm like unplugging the things opening the windows turning on fans I'm like oh my gosh <laughs> or what they might trigger you know sometimes sure. a smell may trigger you to something that remind you of a not so good situation or even a good situation, right? Absolutely. Experience. So how can we support people who have um, smell sensitivities and needs? Be really cautious of those individual environmental smells using scent-free soaps, shampoos, or lotion. Also, investigators, if, if, um, if somebody is really having a hard time, is very distressed and it's out of the blue, really consider um, if there are any new smells in that environment. Um, were there changes in cleaning products? Is there new furniture? You know, did they paint? Did they do, do anything with smells? New it, carpeting. Exactly. And, and that really can impact people's ability to be able to function in whatever role they have at that location. Okay, the next sensed is gustatory. Yes, and I did practice saying that. That is our um, taste. Um, so you may see individuals with ASD who explore their environment by tasting, where they're licking walls and, um, you know, they just, everything goes into their, their mouth as a way to explore that environment. Um, you may see people with pica behavior, where they're tasting or eating non-edibles. Or, or you may see some people who have a very limited diet um, due to inability to tolerate um, a variety of foods due to texture or, or flavor. So how do we support people who may have um, taste needs? Um, you could offer visual supports of what to eat versus what not to eat. Um, creating a pleasant eating environment, never ever forcing someone to eat something that they, they don't want to eat, but enticing them. Um, providing variety of different food, um, lots of different things that you can do. 
All right, so this is the final sense that we're going to cover today. It's, it's one of the more um, newer senses. It's called interoception. Um, interoception is our ability to self-regulate and self-monitor emotions and to be able to read our body signals and respond appropriately. So this, is, um, this helps us to know when we're hungry, when we're too hot or too cold, when we need to use the restroom, when we're thirsty, when we feel pain, or when we feel different emotions. So if somebody who has needs in, uh, with interoception or has a weak interoception um, system, they may not know or feel when they, that first twinge of hunger. And so um, they just, they keep going about their day and then all of a sudden they're hangry and, and that's it. They have to eat right now and it is not pleasant where, and it's kind of out of the blue because they weren't able to tell that they were hungry. So those are just some things to keep in mind. Um, and my husband supports an individual who he was only sleeping two or three hours a night. And the family was, I mean, they were exhausted. They have other kids and he would be up pacing. And what they finally found out through the doctor is that this individual could not regulate his body temperature at all. And he was too hot at night. So they actually ended up turning down the temperature either to 65 degrees at night or 63 in the wintertime. And he like started sleeping the whole night, like at least six wow. to seven hours a night. And the family was like so thankful. And, and that's what it was. I mean, they, they tried melatonin, they tried, you know, sure, sure. all these other things. And it was the, the lack of the body to, to regulate the heat or cold. I'm so glad they were able to find something that helped yeah. them because sleep is so important. But it's something to think about. I mean, I, I see so many MUIs where, oh, the person only sleeps two hours a night, and maybe it's a sensory thing with their regulation of their body temperature. Absolutely. So, something to and explore. And we're going to be sending you some resources on interoception as well, just so that you can take a deeper dive into this information to consider as you're seeing incidents pop up. So remember, sensory strategies are part of a proactive plan. They are built into the person's day, into their routine throughout the day, throughout the day. I can't emphasize this enough. They are planned and predictable. Um, and, and sometimes, you know, some extra support may be added, like around the holidays or a tough time of transition for youth who are in school, that time in between when school's out and into summer, you may have to increase the level of sensory experiences. Or when school starts, maybe you'll have to increase it then as well. Um, and please never, ever withhold sensory as a reward. Um, it, it's, it's imperative. This is biological. Um, we would never offer someone's glasses as a reward. So we would never offer, you know, a, a run or a hike or um, we would never offer that as a reward. This is just what people need. So some other takeaway tips. Monitor your own arousal level, your own volume, rate, pitch of voice, how you're moving when you're working with um, people with ASD. Um, and also, as we've said, sensory strategies, they're used throughout the day, not just in response to a meltdown. I know I've seen lots of incidents where, you know, somebody has a meltdown and then the weighted blanket is offered. Give that weighted blanket throughout the day when that person needs it, not just after, you know, they've had the meltdown. Try to get ahead of it and be proactive. Um, it's really important. Not that you wouldn't give the weighted blanket after somebody's distressed, but making sure that you're offering it throughout the day so um, they're able to get that input. And always, always be a constant observer of behavior, um, constant. You know, individuals' needs will fluctuate depending on the setting, and it's, it's really up to us to be able to look and, and see what's going on in that environment and to provide that input so that they can, they can function at their best. Okay, so earlier we talked about communication considerations when conducting interviews, but now I'd like to talk about sensory. I mean, do you ever listen, think about sensory when you're conducting an interview? Is the room a quiet, private space? Is the room too hot or too cold? Is it calming? Can you dim the lights? Are there distractions in the room? I mean, maybe there's like a pet in the room, or I've been to some uh, day halves that have birds. I mean, you know, is there a distraction that would keep them away, you know, from the conversation that you need to have? Um, what about the time of day? If it's close to break time, that might be a distraction. Or if it's lunchtime. But what about the smells? What if you're next to the cafeteria and it's almost lunchtime and, you're there, you know, they smell these things? Um, and again, is there somebody that can the, the person chooses to be part of the interview? And then for the prevention plan part, 
have we considered the sensory stuff? We have to figure out the cause and contributing factor, and could it be a sensory issue? And of course, we always say number one thing is, you know, ruling out any kind of medical issue. But did you listen to the communication behind the behavior? Did you figure out what it is? Are they experiencing some sort of dental issue or medical issues, as we already talked about, mental health issues? But what might those sensory factors in the environment be that you need to think about? Um, and thinking of them from the perspective of, is their sensory bucket overflowing or is it not fill, full enough? And I, I put the little, um, the little trampoline picture in the middle here or on the side because uh, I was thinking of my family member. He truly is like Tigger. He bounces from room to room. He doesn't walk. He bounces. And he's on his third trampoline right now because when during those winter months when he can't get out, he truly needs something. Um, and so that is a wonderful thing for him. So just thinking about those folks that are, you know, are they getting out? Sometimes our staff aren't able to get out and run or do things with our individuals. They can't just go hiking because there's other people in the home. But are there just little things like, is there a place in the backyard for a swing? Can you put on a dance video and just do that in the house? Can you move furniture and get that that movement sweeping underneath it? Um, it's just something to think about when you know with our individuals who need some sensory input. Uh, and also other questions to ask: Has the person had any changes? You know, is there a new job? Or like the new the the guy in the, our example earlier that that got a new house? Like that was kind of overwhelming. You didn't quite understand been here before, but I didn't know I'm supposed to be living here. So how do we prepare them for those changes? Are there clear, concrete ways that we can communicate that to individuals? And it really seems like pictures might be the best way to do that. Um, but also thinking about the person's trauma history. Do you know their history? Does the team know about their history? What, we, what can we learn from that? Have they had a recent assessment? Um, where's the person most happy or successful? Can we incorporate these things into the day so we prevent incidents from happening? And have any of the strategies you've tried recently, you know, worked? And maybe they didn't. And maybe, you know, that alarm on the door didn't work for the individual that kept leaving or the alarm on the window. But let's get to the heart of the matter. You know, he wanted to go visit grandma and grandpa. So how can we make this part of his day or his week so he doesn't have to leave at all hours of the night and scare staff to death when they go in his room and he's not there? Um, but just thinking about the sensory needs and have we trained our staff to think about those sensory and communication needs. So please share these training modules to help educate the teams, especially the DSPs that are working you know, with our folks. All right, here's some more information about the Guide to Assistive Technology uh, Lending Libraries in Ohio. Again, it was developed by the DD Council. So not only do they have assistive technology, but they also have adaptive toys. I realize that's probably not the best word to use, but um, sometimes those adaptive toys are really great for sensory input, um, and it's a great way just to see if it's going to work for the person, are they going to respond appropriately, so we will get this resource out to you to share with teams, and it's throughout the entire state, and there's lots and lots of options. It's very exciting. So can you explain what the lending library is? So like if I wanted to check out some kind of technology, I could maybe check it out for free for a period of time. Is that how it works? Absolutely. Um, I'm sure each one has a different process, but I know Ocali has a lending library. You just send in a request. You have to uh, set up a free account, and then they will ship it to you free along, and you get to keep it, I think, for like two weeks, maybe three weeks, and then you get they send you everything to ship it back as well. So it's completely free, but it's a great way to try out new things and you know to help people communicate or just to help them you know fill their buckets with sensory input Excellent. all right as I said I know we went through a lot of information this morning a lot of information so this is yet another resource that you could use in addition to the autism strategies in action this is the autism internet module sensory differences also developed by Ocali um, and this is one hour, and it will give you even further information on sensory differences. Excellent. I'm going to go over a couple things, um, housekeeping items that I neglected to talk about in the beginning. And we have a couple minutes left for questions. So please feel free to type in some questions while I'm talking about certificates and, and some wrap-up things here. Um, for everyone that is joining us today live, which is on May 28th, 
for this presentation. You will get one hours of continuing professional development um, credits emailed to you. So if you logged on to the system, um, no need to do anything further. Within 30 days, we will email your certificate to you. And those uh, the one hour of CPDs is good for um, service and support administrators and investigative agents. And then for everyone else, you'll also have just record of your attendance today. Um, next, if you are attending as a group, so I know um, I've talked to several county boards where they have, you know, a group of SSAs who who um, attend these webinars um, together. They watch it on one person's screen, so they have one person logged in. The other people should feel free to type in their names on the Excel spreadsheet that was sent to everyone that registered. Um, it's, it's considered the Excel group attendance sheet. If you email back the Excel spreadsheet, um, then those people will also get a certificate emailed to them. Important things to note, you need to obviously make sure that you're typing into the Excel spreadsheet and that each person has their own email address so we can get that information out to you. Um, let's see, what else did we want to talk about? Um, so we know we went through a lot of things uh, very quickly. We will be sending out additional information and resources. Please share this with teams, um, with the direct support professionals. Obviously, um, they work most directly with individuals. They often have really good ideas when it comes to prevention planning, also um, noting changes in an individual's behavior and what that might communicate to all of us. So uh, please share this information with everyone. Um, we have taped this webinar. It will be posted on our website um, within the next week. So if you'd like to use it in a future training, please feel free to do so. Um, I'm going to check and see if our presenters have any last comments. And we'll wait and see if anyone has any additional questions. Heather, Jody, anything else in parting? There is one other resource that we're going to be sending out with your certificates, and that is the link to the Autism Series Live Binder that was developed by Ocali. Um, and there are two um, two of the sessions, Communication and Sensory, which we've used all of the information for today's webinar um, from that resource. But you'll be able to get in there and use some different um, tools and strategies. If you have any questions, please reach out to Jody or me. Most definitely. And, you know, the only thing that I wanted to stress is sometimes I see a cause and contributing factor is, oh, the individual just, they're just kind of aggressive sometimes, or they're verbally aggressive. And I really want you to think about what they're trying to say with that behavior, whether it's a verbal behavior or just a physical behavior, that there's a message behind there. And it may be really hard, but sometimes we've got to try to figure out what that is, and that will help them and help the whole team and the roommates. And, you know, I just... It's a big, important piece of the puzzle. Absolutely. And we have amazing investigators and providers out there. And um, if anyone can get down to the cause contributing factors, we know you guys can. For sure. Um, so in closing, we wanted to thank you for your time today. Um, please look for additional resources and your certificate from us. And if you have any questions, please feel free to reach out. We'd be happy to partner with you. And um, we look forward to talking and working with you in the future. Thank you very much.